Thank you, brother. We've uh, enjoyed our time together here all together these last couple of days with you. Uh, this is Preaching Juice. If you want to uh, know how long I'm going to preach, when I get finished with drinking the water, I'll be finished my message. Now, don't get too much hope because I drink slow. Take your Bible and turn to Philippians chapter 3. Uh, thank you, brother, for that prayer. Remind me of a guy I heard pray years ago. He said, Lord, take this preacher and fill him with a high test gasoline, anoint him with pure kerosene, and then set him on fire. Amen. It was a great explosion, I promise you. Amen. Well, we met you, as your pastor said, uh, about three years ago now. It's hard to believe it's been that long ago. We went to the Holy Land, came back in December, and uh, Brad brought the COVID back with him and began to spread it in America. And uh, so he's the reason why everybody got sick the last two and a half years. But uh, he was just a, a refreshing to meet he and Jill. They love you. They love your, this church. Uh, they love you as his people. And it was just good to meet a pastor that's just real and sincere and crazier than what I am. It was so refreshing. So let's stand together. Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 7. But what things were gained to me, those I kind of lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I might win Christ, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering, be made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either already perfect, but I fall after, if I, might, may, I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you today to thank you for the cross. God, thank you, Lord, the cross is empty today. And Father, I ask you today that we would just worship the resurrected Lord. Indeed, worthy is the Lamb. Now, Lord, you know I'm nothing. Lord, you know I'm weak. And I pray today that Jesus would be the preacher. God, open our hearts, open our ears, give us obedient hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, this is an uh, unusual day. I I was telling our church last Sunday, I said, please pray for me. I didn't realize when I was booking flights that I'll be on the airplane at 9-11. That's not a good thing. I told them I'm not superstitious, but I don't like to take chances either. But uh, so you pray for that flight. Do you remember where he was at 21 years ago? Most of you wouldn't even be alive 21 years ago. Uh, but I actually was in a dentist chair. And uh, Dennis is a friend of mine, and, and he was working on my teeth. And I said, ha, ha, ha. And uh, he looked at the TV and said, boy, what's going on? And all of a sudden, the second plane crashed, and, uh, and man, what a time that was. And I was just thinking this morning, just uh, praying for our nation and looking at that, listening to some things today. It's amazing how 21 years ago in our community, the community came together. We had a community-wide prayer meeting. We're out in the countryside. Your folks are downtown compared to where I'm at. And uh, we gathered around a, near the post office there. All, everybody did together and prayed and and uh, just, uh, just came together to remember things. And we said we'd never forget. And it seemed like that patriotism uh, was at an all-time high. Uh, I, I remember folks coming to our church that had never been before. I said, Lord, this may be a revival. You maybe got our attention. But unfortunately, it didn't last very long. And now 21 years later, the greatest threat is not someone crashing into an Empire State building or Twin Towers, but the greatest threat is socialism and communism that's invaded our land. Unless we have a move of God, I'm telling you, unless we have a move of God, our nation's sunk. The greatest enemy is never on the outside. The greatest enemy is always on the inside. Well, let's look at this scripture this morning. I love the book of Philippians. It's called the book of joy. I love going and preaching in the book of Philippians. And I was praying much about what to share today. And this is not a, 
uh, unique title with me. You've heard this title probably on different passages. But I call this the great exchange. One day the Lord Jesus Christ was walking and, and a crowd came around him and he laid down the requirements for discipleship in Mark chapter 8. The Bible says he called the people unto him with his disciples. He said, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. For whosoever save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and for the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Then he asks this, or what shall a man give? And here's the word, an exchange for a soul. Well, that's not a way to get a crowd. Jesus would not have been a good uh, writer of uh, church growth books. Matter of fact, he said that many people turned back from following him. And uh, what would you give in exchange for your soul? Boy, what a question that is. What would a person give in exchange for the soul? Uh, this past week, as happens many times in the ministry, I was called to the hospital. And uh, I was in a room with a man who uh, was very, very conscious. Doctors told him he had a short time to live. And within two hours, he took his last breath. And I was able to talk to him. I've talked to him through the years and he has shared with me he got saved along the way. And, and I said, well, Dave, just want to be sure now you fix and take your last breath. Matter of fact, he said, preacher, I'm fixing to die. I said, that's what they tell us. And I said, Dave, you know, I want to be sure, Dave. Do you know where you're going? I know, preacher. I said, Dave, do you know Christ is Lord and Savior? Yes, yes, I do. And the minute they came and gave him some drugs and a few hours, a couple, but less than two hours, uh, I watched him just whew, take his last breath. And I thought about the time, the first time I met Dave, I said, Dave, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. He said, well, preacher, I'm not interested. And I watched him through the years, and thankfully I saw him come to Christ and get saved, and there was some fruit I believe he was saved. But I wondered, you know, what would happen if Dave had never came to Christ? And I wonder how many people, they're exchanging their soul for hell. They're exchanging their soul for things that in the end it's going to be burned up. It won't matter. And I promise you, when Dave was in a hospital room, his wife did not call the local bar. She didn't call the local drug addict. She said, Preacher, would you come and pray with us and be with us? Because now we're going to face God. And don't be a fool to think today you're sitting here and you're going to live on this earth forever. You're going to die. If Jesus tarries, you're going to die. But one reason I like this story because this story is a little bit like my story is this story talks about how Paul exchanged religion for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul had Jewish religion. I had, I had Baptist religion. Matter of fact, you could have called me Johnny the Baptist. I was a good Baptist. I was actually pastor of church when I got saved. And I think every Baptist preacher ought to get saved. Amen. Every Baptist preacher ought to get saved. And... Uh, and so we're going to look today just a little bit at his testimony. Someone said this, Paul desired a full operation of this life, the Christ life, the surge of his Christian experience in such a manner, the fragrance of the life of his Lord would permeate his life. Isn't that a great thing? The fragrance of the life of his Lord would permeate his life. Let me give you three things real quickly. First of all, and I say that just to encourage you, the word quickly, that's a good encouragement. I want you to look at Paul's abandonment. Look what he says there again in verse 7. What things were gained to me, those I kind of lost for Christ. So there's a crisis about his abandonment. Now, he said, what things were gained. All the things in life I kind of gained. I looked at those things. When Christ came to me, I was at a crisis point. I was at a crossroads point. Either I had to hold on to my religion and refuse Christ or say no to all that I'd kind of gained, all that I valued, and say yes to Jesus Christ. Paul was a, uh, he, he describes himself earlier. He said, you, you know what I was? I was a tribe of, I was a stock of Israel. I was a tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrew. I, I was touching the law, I was a Pharisee. I persecuted the church. Uh, touching the law, he said I was blameless. Who could say that? I mean, Paul was a very religious man. And he had all, listen, he was popular. I think he was there when Stephen was stoned. I think he may have held his coat. 
Uh, he, he, he was respected. He was not just an ordinary Jew. He was a Jew of the Jews. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And for him to deny all that meant he'd lose everything, all the credibility he had, all the popularity he had if he came to the Lord Jesus Christ. The very one he was against, the very one that he stood against, the very one he was taking people to prison over and killing people over, he, 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 had, to, he had to just choke all his pride down and give all that away. And that's what happened to me one Friday. Uh, a lady gave me a track when a Baptist preacher got saved. I was telling the deacons the other, night, the other day. And sure enough, it was a crisis point. Now, Jesus didn't appear to me, uh, but the Holy Spirit of God came in that room. And I thought about it. I, here was a 20-year-old preacher, 21-year-old preacher at that time, and preaching revivals, popular in that little area I was in. And, and uh, man, I went to a liberal school, so I argued with professors and uh, was a conservative, very, very conservative. Matter of fact, I was a fundamental. And, and uh, that was back in the days when hippie days just kind of going out of style. And, uh, and I tell folks, I, I preached against long hair. Could you imagine me preaching against long hair? I would not preach against long hair today if I had to. Praise God, I wish I had some long hair. I do have some long hair. There's my nose my ears. But, uh, but I, God brought me to a crisis point, a crossroads point. And, and the pastor I talked to, I told our deacons the other day, is he said, well, I said, what if I get saved? What would happen to our church? He said, well, you can go to hell and let people think you're good or you let God take care of it. And I think today in this room, there's probably some folks at a crisis point. Maybe you come to church. And week after week, Brother Brad preaches a gospel share. And, uh, and you may be a good church member. But over and over again, God brings you to a point of saying, you know what, you have religion. You know all about the Bible. You know all about the Lord, but you don't know the Lord. Maybe at a crisis point in your life, maybe right now, God's allowed some things to you, happen to you, what we call a crowding you the Christ. What you've trusted is no longer bringing joy and happiness and peace. And your life is a searching, there's an emptiness. And God, by His Holy Spirit, is bringing you to a crisis point. That's what happened to Paul. And at that point, Paul had to make a decision of he's going to abandon all he thought, all he had lived for, and come to this Christ that he thought was a fake, that he thought was not who he said he was. And Christ appeared to him at Damascus Road and showed Paul by revelation that Jesus Christ was indeed the Son of God and showed him that he alone was a pavement for sin and showed Paul that his righteousness could not get into heaven. And the only thing that could happen to him was trusting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now listen to me. Get this straight this morning. I don't know how Baptist you are or what denomination you may be, but you can be a Baptist and go to hell. It's just as close to hell in this church pews as a barroom stool. Listen, you can serve in this Baptist church. You can sing this Baptist choir, teach a Baptist Sunday school class, and still die and go to hell. You may have great religion, you may even die. And this pastor have your casket and speak well of you. And while he's speaking well of you and people are thinking, boy, he must be in heaven, be burning in hell. If I died before that Friday, there'd been some preacher get up and say, oh, look at Brother David. Boy, look at the preacher he was. Uh, look how he was a soul winner. Look what he did. We know today he's in heaven and I'd been frying in hell. And I wonder today, in your heart of hearts, maybe Sunday after Sunday you sit here and you're lost at the Lord Jesus Christ. Other people give testimonies, but you have a testimony. Your testimony is not real. And God bought Paul this place of a crisis that he had to abandon. And he was confronted with the truth. He had to understand all he did was not going to work. All he trusted was not going to work. He was come, he was brought to a moment of decision. And I want this morning of God it's been bringing you to a moment of decision, the crisis of abandonment. But there's a cost of his abandonment. In verse 8, it says, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss. All things but loss. But that's an accounting term. Paul said, I, I looked on my books, and here is my religion. I obey the law. I was, a, uh, I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a stock of Israel. I kept the law. I was blameless. Here's my books. I mean, look, look here, man. I got a lot on my account. And he looked over here and said, well, here's the requirement for heaven. He said, hmm, 
Loss. Loss. And he wrote off all his books. There's nothing in those books that get him there. He saw all these things I was counting on. In my accounting, all these things were nothing but loss. And wouldn't it be a shame for a man who's trusting all he's trusting to get him to heaven and when he dies to realize it's nothing. It's nothing. Matter of fact, I used to be up front with you. Brad may not let me say this. Uh, but really, if you're not going to get serious about the Lord, I'd stay home and sleep. Amen. I mean, man, you're just wasting time. And if you, if you say, you know, I'm, just, I'm not going to swallow my pride and get saved. And, you know, I'm just, uh, just going to keep on doing what I'm doing. But, you know, I don't want people to think bad of me, so I'm going to go to church down there. And what? I, 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 go ahead and take a little nap on Sunday morning at home. That bed's a whole lot more comfortable than the pew. Amen. Than the seat you're sitting in. So there's a cost. It's almost like the rich young ruler. Remember the rich young ruler, he came to Jesus and he said, good master, listen, life's most important question. What must I do to go to heaven? And Christ said, well, have you kept the commandments? Done this, done that. He said, all these things I kept my youth up. Touching the law, he said, I'm blameless. He said, would you like one thing? Sell all that you have and come and follow me. Now, would selling all he had make him saved? No. But the Lord knew that was his God. And what he was saying is, get rid of this God you got called money and come and follow me. And the Bible says, as a moment of decision, as a crisis point, the cost is laid out. And a man looked at the cost and he said, I refuse to give this up. And what he did, he lost it all thinking he was going to keep everything he had. But I got news for him. When he died, he didn't take a dime with him. Not a dime with him. He, the Bible says, he went away sad, but he went away with all his earthly riches. But he went away without salvation. And so he refused to come to the end of himself. On that day I got saved, God wrestled me to the end of myself. He, uh, the Holy Spirit of God said, hey, if you die today, how do you know to go to heaven? I said, well, I'm a preacher. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Um, Man, if that was true, we'd try to make everybody preachers. Amen. Uh, well, Lord, you know, I, uh, I, I believe the Bible. You know the devil believes the Bible. Uh, well, Lord, I, I, I pray with some folks get saved. You can be a good salesman to do that. Uh, and, but all of us a works, works answer. I could not say because I repented of my sin and listen, and trusted Christ and Christ, listen to this word, alone. I had something added to Christ, something added to grace. You add anything to grace, it takes away grace. And Paul said, all these things that I counted as gain, I understood there's nothing. I counted but loss. I counted all things for loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. But look at the Christ of his abandonment, the Christ. Notice some words in verse 8. I counted loss for Christ. Verse 8, Christ Jesus my Lord. And I might win Christ. Verse 9, the faith of Christ. You know, uh, we call Jesus, Jesus. We call him Lord. We call him Christ. But all those titles have different meanings. And so when Paul writes this, he purposely, by the Holy Spirit, used the title as Christ. That word Christ, the word Messiah. We say it's the word Savior. And what, what Paul was shown by Revelation is that he needed a Savior. He needed someone to save him. You know why? Because he was lost. You know why? Because he could not save himself. He was trying to do that. He could not. He was trying to save himself. And so he said, what I need, I need a Christ. And that Savior became his Lord. And what he did, he abandoned, he abandoned all of the Christ, all of the lords to have Christ as his Lord. He couldn't have any more religious works. Uh, he couldn't he couldn't do anything else. He needed a Savior. And there's only one that could save him. And that was Jesus Christ. He was a perfect man. He was a God man. He's the only worthy lamb that can be slain for our sin. He's the only accepted sacrifice for sin. It's by his righteousness that the only way he could be saved. Uh, don't you like Christmas is fixing to come up? Matter of fact, uh, last uh, June, I went to Sam's. I already got the Christmas stuff out. Um, and uh, 
but, but remember what happened at Christmas time when the angels come? Behold, I'll bring you good tidings of great joy. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, Christ the Lord. And what shall he do? He shall take away your sin. Your sin. So what are you going to do with your sin? You need a Savior. Look at Paul's acquirement. Look at what Paul got. His abandonment. But look at what Paul got in verse 8. First of all, he got an invaluable intimacy. Look what he says. That I, for the ecstasy of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, that I might know him. Now listen, Paul knew all about God, but he didn't know him. He didn't know him. He knew about him, but he didn't know him. The first church I pastored uh, was up in the foothills of North Carolina. And here's a couple of ladies there that knew God. They just oozed Jesus, man. Uh, one lady, she just walked with the Lord so much. And uh, of course, I was her pastor for two years lost. And uh, that's not good. And, uh, and one day, uh, I was out visiting and I went by one of these ladies' house, Miss Eula, and she had an apple pie in the oven and I uh, walked in. She said, I've been expecting you. She said, God told me you was coming by. I said, okay. And uh, she said, I baked, I baked us a pie. I want you some pie. And I've been praying for you. And she had a Bible, a box of Kleenex there where she'd cry. And man, she just knew God. She just talked about the Lord and uh, man, just, just oozed Jesus, just knew him. Now I knew about him. I had my Bible. I, I've been to a school. I, I read my Bible. I preached. I knew about it. But she, she knew him. Now, there's another lady named Miss Etta. And one day she said, hey, preacher, would you go with me and, and, uh, and Miss Eula and we'll go see Miss Overcash and we'll have a prayer meeting. And uh, Miss Overcash stuttered a little bit. And uh, she got to pray and said, dear, 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 dear Jesus. But I tell you what, heaven came down. Yeah. And those ladies knew God. And, uh, and right then, Brother Brad, I said, I don't know God. I don't know Jesus like they know him. I mean, man, they had a relationship with him. A few years ago, we had a retired firefighter from Miami uh, moved to where we're at. We, we live on a, a lake, and, uh, near a lake, and so he came to retire on that lake. And he was raised in Catholic, Catholicism. And one day he came to see me after a few Sundays. I need to talk to you. He said, I've been a Catholic all my life. He said, there's something different about you folks this church. I said, what is it? He said, you folks here act like y'all know God. Y'all like y'all got a relationship with him. I said, I won't tell you why, because we do. He said, but I don't have that. But before he left that day, he did. And now he's moved back to Florida. Unfortunately, he's in bad health. So Paul had a invaluable intimacy. What things were gained to me, I counted for the, for the for laws, for the excellency, the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Wow. Do you really know Jesus today? How many do you really know him? Is he alive in your heart? Can you sing that old song, I come to the garden alone, and he walks with me and talks with me. He fellowships with me. He's not just somebody the preacher preaches about. He's not somebody just on the page of the scripture. But he's alive with inside you. You have a knowledge. You know him intimately with him. Jesus said this, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known of mine. I know them and they know me. John 17, 3, this is life eternal. They may know the only true God in Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Christ, Christianity is Christ. Listen, the name Christ Jesus Lord He's my Lord Jesus Christ. I know him. He's my Lord, but he's my Savior. And I know this, this man who lived and died and rose again named Jesus because he's Lord. I know him. Now listen to me. I watched y'all today, and I know y'all trying to figure me out. You won't. Ask my wife. But try your best not to start shouting on this next point because some people are asleep. You wake them up. Don't do that, all right? Not only did Paul have an invaluable intimacy, but Paul gained an imputed righteousness. Look what the Bible says. Whom I have suffered the loss of all things who count them but dung that I might win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is the law, but that 
that righteousness which is through the faith of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God by faith. A while ago, there's on the screen the scripture from Galatians about faith. The just shall live by faith. You know the story of Martin Luther. He is a Catholic priest. And he would beat himself thinking that would make him earn his salvation. He read the book of Romans and he read in Romans, the just shall live by faith. And God, by the Holy Spirit, revealed to him it was not by his religious works but by faith in Christ Jesus alone that he could save the faith in Christ. So what happens when somebody trusts Christ? Well, let's go back to that accounting term again. Paul said, I count all things but loss. He said, so in that book, here's my righteousness. And God looked at that book of my righteousness and my self-righteousness does not satisfy God's righteousness. Can I tell you this morning, the only thing that satisfies God's righteousness is God's righteousness. Unless you're as righteous as God, He's not satisfied with your righteousness. So here's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. He came to the cross, He paid the payment for your sin. He, he, he came and gave us, He imputed on our account, inputted on our account, imputed on our account, and what God did in the accounting room in heaven, He took the pavement of Jesus Christ, David Blizzard. All right, He put it on my account. And today when the Lord, when God looks at my account, He does not see my righteousness because I ain't got none, okay? What he sees, he sees Jesus Christ paid in full. And the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me from all my sin. In a day when God sees me, he only sees me through Jesus Christ. When God sees me, and listen, that's how we should look at each other. But you take away the blood and you take away his righteousness, you ain't gonna like what you see. But what God does, and He sees me now, He sees me through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And listen, folks, God gave him imputed righteousness. The requirement for our acceptance is only His righteousness. You know what self-righteousness is? Religion. That's what it is. And listen, that's the reason why today, listen, there's more people going to church today than ever before. I mean, just watch TV. Yeah, watch, watch some of those folks on TV that I'm always amazed how people can preach something false and everybody, everybody goes to it, you know. It's just crazy. And, uh, and just watch. And men, they think, boy, if I can just get religion, if I can just join that church, if I can get baptized, if I can just, uh, we have what I call Hollywood Christianity today. And everything's popular, you know. Uh, man, it's, you gotta have the, you gotta get in the, you gotta read the right books, listen to the right tapes, sing the right music, uh, go to the right church, and all those things. And listen, folks, that's not it at all. It's Jesus Christ, his righteousness. The requirement is the righteousness of God. Listen, here's what I'm saying. To go to heaven, you have to be as holy as God. Anybody here that holy? Not by yourself. But in Christ you are. Because when God sees you, He sees Jesus. So when He sees Jesus, guess what He sees? He sees His holiness. So I'm accepted on Him. But also, there's a the way to require this righteousness. How do you acquire it? Well, here's how you acquire it. The Bible says, which is the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is the, through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God by faith. It's by believing. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe Him and Him alone. Now, again, how God's Holy Spirit convicted me about my lostness, He showed me I was not trusting Christ and Christ alone. I knew all the facts. I knew Christ on the cross. I could quote John 3, 16. I've taken tracts and prayed with people to get saved. I went through soul winning courses and learned the techniques and the sales, sales, salesmanship of somebody uh, twisting their arm a little bit and saying a prayer with me. And I knew all that. But I was not trusting Christ and Christ alone. So if you're adding anything at all, again, I'll say this, if you add anything at all to grace, you're not trusting Christ and Christ alone. If you die today, and I ask you, why should you go to heaven? You say, well, you know, I got baptized when I was 12, and I prayed a prayer with the preacher, and, and I, I've been to church all my life. I read my Bible once a month, and, and I give a $2 every week. Uh, you know, 
Uh, you got all these works you can do. That's, that's not going to do it. And so he says that, that what happens is we have to, by faith, just trust Christ and Christ alone. I hate to tell you this. Uh, uh, we went to the Holy Land and, you know, the Dead Sea, you can float on the Dead Sea. And some of them, did y'all get in the water at the Dead Sea? You did. Your wife did. Uh, but uh, here I am, I'm six foot three, and uh, I'm afraid of water. Matter of fact, I really appreciate where you put me up at in the motel because they had a shower. I don't even get in the bathtub unless I have to. Uh, I'm the youngest of nine children. And so uh, sometimes we'd go fishing on a creek or a little river, and mom would say, boys, you get in that river, you're going to drown. She couldn't watch us all. And so my idea was, if you put your foot in the water, you're gone. You're going you're gonna to die. And so my wife is just the opposite. She loves the water. Uh, we, when we go to the beach, we go to Myrtle Beach, that area. And uh, so she will get in the water. If I did not holler at her and tie a rope on her, she'd swim to China. She loves the water. Uh, I could tell you many horrible tales about her in the water. She's a daredevil in the water. I don't. I go far out as long as don't come no further than here. And uh, as long as my feet can touch the bottom, I'm okay. And uh, it's, a, it's so sad. It says six foot three, 65 year old man playing in the kiddie pool and on vacation. It's so sad. But uh, I can float a little bit. I have learned to float. But here's what she would tell me David, take your feet off the bottom and you'll float. I said, Yeah. And about an hour after I died, I, I do some chapels where we have a big lake around us. I've been in a lot of drownings. And uh, I mean, I told my son, he's another daredevil in the water. I said, son, every drowning I've been to, you know what they say about them? They're a good swimmer. He said, of course they are. They wouldn't have been in the water, they wouldn't swim. I said, man, they, supposed, they weren't supposed to drown. They're a good swimmer, swim. And, but you know what? I, I finally, one time, one time, one time I went to the ocean. As a matter of fact, I was in Tobago. We went on a mission trip, Trinidad and Tobago. And it was almost so salty. You could literally just take your feet off the water and lay back and just float forever. And what I did, I took my feet off the bottom. I quit trusting myself. And I laid back on that water and for about 20 minutes and floated because I took my feet off the bottom and quit trusting myself. And there's a lot of folks there who are struggling. They're trying their best to keep their feet on the bottom in religion. And what you've got to do is come to a place of taking your feet off the bottom and trust in Jesus Christ by faith and Him and Him alone. If you do that, you'll enjoy coming to church. You enjoy the things of God. But as long as you're out there, I don't enjoy the water. I don't. But my wife does. Why? Because she takes her feet off the bottom. I don't, and listen, I, I admire her. But you here today, you've never done that. So what, what it does, you get this righteousness by faith. The just shall live by faith. By faith and faith alone. So there's Paul's, what he acquired by faith. But then there's Paul's affection. Look what it says in verse 10. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection. So now Paul, boy, now, now it's changing. He hated Christ. He had the things of Christ. But now he said, oh, that I might know him. Well, a while ago he said he knew him, but now he's going to know him some more. Because guess what? You can never exalt all that you know about Jesus. Paul prayed twice in the book of Ephesians that the Ephesian church might know about the love of God, might know its height, might know its width, width might know its depth, might know its length. And it amazed a very church he prayed for that would know the love of Christ. In the book of Revelation, he says they left that love. And so he said, now I might know him. And so the great thing about being a Christian is once you meet him and know him, you get to know him. You get to know him. And you get to know more and more about him. And listen, the more I know him, the more I want to know about him. Matter of fact, I can say this. It gets sweeter every day. It gets better every day. The more I know him, the more I want to know him. But also he said, I might know the power of his resurrection. And it's amazing. So now I have a new life in me. Before, I could not overcome sin. 
There's a resurrection power in me. The Bible says the same power that raised up Christ from the dead, that same power lives in me. And listen, will I sin? Yeah. Do I have to sin? No. Will I be sinless? No. Can I sin less? Yes. And so now the power of Christ, resurrection power lives in me today. That same power that got Christ up from the dead now lives in me. So now I have power of the flesh. I have the strength. It's his life now being lived through me. So there's resurrection power. But also he saw another fellowship of his suffering. Before Paul, when he suffered, it was all about Paul. He suffered because of what Paul did. <laughs> I'm ashamed to say most of my troubles I bring upon myself. But now Paul saw another fellowship of his suffering. What was the fellowship of his suffering? How did Jesus suffer? Well, Philippians chapter 2 said he suffered because he became obedient to God. Even so much so, he became obedient to death, even to death of the cross. His suffering was suffering because of obedience. I have to be honest, most of my suffering is because of disobedience. But he said, now this resurrection power enables me to obey my Lord. As I obey my Lord, walk in this world, this world's not going to like that, and I'll enter into the fellowship of suffering. And he said, I might be made conformable unto his death, that death of obedience. In 1956, a group of five men went to South America. The men went to South America. And they went to, uh, to witness, be missionaries to a cannibalistic tribe. And many of you know the story. Uh, they got there, and uh, one day they went to the tribe, and they all were killed. One of those men's name was Jim Elliott. You may have heard of Elizabeth Elliott. And Jim Elliott said this before he went. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool to give up what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. And Paul said, I'm conformable to his death. And then here's an interesting statement. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. I pondered that and I prayed over that. Matter of fact, last night I prayed over some more. And uh, one, one person said that he's talking here about the judgment of Christ but I don't think so. I think he's talking about right now. Is that he has resurrected life right now. And resurrected life right now means this. I can live on earth just like I'm living in heaven. Amen. Thou will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And right now because Christ is in me, I can live right now just like I was living in heaven. How's it going to be in heaven? It'll be for the glory of God and for his praise for eternity. And right now, death to self, life in Christ, gives me resurrection power, the resurrection of the dead. That rich young ruler, I thought about him a lot. Could you imagine what happened to him? We don't know. He went away sad. And Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't chase him down. You see, you can go to hell if you want to. We tell folks, hey, you've you got a choice, you can go to heaven. Hey, you've got a choice, you can go to hell. Nobody can make you. If it could, I would. And you hear this morning, God may have brought you at a crisis point. It may have some things happen in your life that's crowded you to Christ. It may be that emptiness is there that's never been filled. It may be that, that you're so religious, you just, you're mean. Most meanest people I've met in my life are religious folks. Hey, listen, a, a Baptist a church fight's worse than a barroom brawl. <laughs> I mean, man, and you, got, you just got religion. Matter of fact, if you died, the preacher, he just do what I said a while ago. He, he said all good things about you, all kinds of good things about you. And people say, oh man, he's in heaven. But in your heart of hearts, you know you're lost and dying and going to hell. And I'll tell you something, man. Religious people are the hardest people in the world to see to come to Christ. Because they're so trusting self. But Paul, one day, on that day of the Master's Road, a great exchange happened. And Paul, in everybody's eyes, who looked so righteous, that day, his righteousness was exchanged for the righteousness of Christ. And his life died, and he had got the life of Christ. And he exchanged hell for heaven. <laughs> and man, Paul, man, Paul got life. He got life. And I'm so glad today I got a life sentence. Amen. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Hey, get a life. Amen. Get a life. Would you pray with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed.
Hey, are you at that crisis point this morning? Has the Holy Spirit of God been working on you? And you've been here. This past June, I was well on vacation. My associate pastor called me and said, Hey, preacher. He said, uh, Brandon came to see me. And Brandon said, For the last five years, he knew he was lost. And Brandon got saved while he was gone. Five years, he knew he was lost. The Holy Spirit of God wrestled with him. He finally had a life exchanged. And this morning, you're here with the Lord Jesus Christ. You got religion. I mean, it, it, it's like when I got saved. When I got saved, it shocked people. And you look so good. Or maybe you're here today, man, and you know, you know, you're empty. Only Christ can fill that void. And we're going to give an invitation. In a minute, we're going to stand and sing. We've got some folks down in front that can greet you and meet you. And I encourage you to go to them and say, listen, today I need Jesus. Or maybe come to the altar and pray. This morning, don't leave here. This is your Damascus road. Come to Jesus. Father in heaven, we come to you today and I pray in Christ's name you'd move. And Lord, I pray that today that person that you're drawing to you would say yes to you. And they become a great exchange today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together. If you need to come, you come. Just